Are you ready? We flick a switch at home, and electricity floods the room with light. We spend it on cooking, eating, taking a hot shower, browsing the internet. Yet, recent unfortunate developments have shown us that we have been taking for granted something that may not be. Unexpectedly, war has broken out in the European continent. The situation in Ukraine of the counter-offensive... And suddenly, we fear energy shortages, which may limit the heating in our homes, or we feel an ease when opening the letter with our latest electricity bill with yet another increase in prices. When the need arises to spend less energy, we have a hard time coming up with effective ways to do it. Is there something we can do to ensure supply and reduce the price? The answer may lie in the very origins of this energy. Where did it come from? How was it produced before it reached our homes? Setting aside the complexity of the energy market, we need to be aware that not all energy is created equal, nor has the same environmental footprint. Different sources have different impacts and release different amounts of greenhouse gases. The war will end sooner or later, let us hope sooner, but climate change is here to stay. And we need to act. It's the fight of our lives. And learning how the energy we're using came to be is crucial to enact effective change. But do not worry. We are not here to bring sad news. We are here to talk about new ideas. Ideas that go as far back as the 10th century. Ideas that later turned into concepts developed during the early days of the Industrial Revolution and that can help us envision a greener, more sustainable future. Join us on a journey that starts in a spicy scented lab in ancient India. Disembark on the other side of the world, walk through the streets of Victorian London, and travel south, towards Spain, to discover the picturesque village of Aras de los Olmos, where the people are set on changing how they power their lives in the future. Let's travel the world while diving into the microscopic realm and discover how the microbes that live all around us may hold the key to solving the challenge of modern energy production. For the next quarter hour, we ask ourselves how to untie the Gordian knot of energy production. From our homes, small villages already working on their own independent power grids, to powering countries and continents with renewable fuels. How can we, together, produce enough energy while walking towards a desirable future? You're listening to Fuel by Microbes, a podcast from the European research project Micro for Biogas. I am Joana Branco, and I'm here with you today to discuss everything and anything biogas. Listen wherever you get podcasts. Since we have already started talking about how expensive electricity has become, it is no coincidence that we begin this episode with the story of an alchemist. Nagarjuna lived in the 10th century in India. That's around the year 900 of our time. And he was immersed in doing well, let's say what we imagine alchemists do, trying to convert other metals into gold or concoct the elixir of eternal life. Nagarjuna experimented in various fields, and for some reason, best known to himself, he ended up mixing cow dung and water in a sealed container. And that's when he made an incredible discovery. That mix it prepared, it ended up producing a flammable gas. He called that Kubargais, which translates to cow dung gas in Hindi, and he hypothesized that this substance could be used to create a flame, light lamps, even cook food. What Nagarjuna had inside his container was, in fact, what we now know as biogas. He was probably not the first to manipulate this substance. There are some obscure references to biogas being used by the Assyrians to heat their baths, dating back to 3000 BC. But wait, we're going way too fast. Let's stop for a minute and get something straight. Why on earth does cow dung produce a substance that can burn with a bright flame? To clear this up, we've decided to call an expert and ask him how come biogas comes out of decomposing cow poop. The organic matter is transformed into, among other things, a mixture of gases. Those gases can be typically um, uh, a combination of CO2 and methane. So this combination of CO2 and methane, among other gases, is what is known as uh, biogas. This is Professor Manuel Porcar. 
head of the biotechnology and scientific biology lab at the I2SIS Bio Institute of the University of Valencia. He's also the leader of the Micro for Biogas project. So the good thing about biogas is that uh, the main gas is methane, and methane can be burned in order to produce power, energy, heat. Nagarjuna didn't have the knowledge to understand why and how the decay of organic matter produced a flammable gas. But during the 18th century, this process was observed happening in nature too, around marshes. And by then, science was ready to understand it. If you've ever visited a marsh with all its water and grass moving in the wind, you probably wouldn't say there's much decay. It doesn't smell rotten. Well, at least not how I imagined the Gauding experiment must have smelled. But the composition is there. It's just hidden from view, happening slowly, underground. It was a man named Alexander Volta, who, looking closely, noticed something happening in the marshes. A detail of extreme importance for our story. Mm. You see, Volta was an Italian chemist and physicist. A pioneer in the field of power and electricity even invented the first electric battery. And he also took a closer look at how marsh gas was produced, reaching a peculiar conclusion. The production of flammable gas only happened in the absence of oxygen. When that vegetation formed the crust that covered the soil, preventing air from reaching the organic material trapped below, Volta discovered that gas was produced. And that tiny detail changed everything given rise eventually to an entire field of research, the study of anaerobic digestion. As the term anaerobic digestion uh, uh, means is that we have conditions where there is no oxygen. Uh, in anaerobic digestion, we have several groups of microorganisms that they decompose biomass in smaller fractions of matter and uh, after that other groups of bacteria they decompose uh, that matter to acetic acid and finally to methane and carbon dioxide so we get the composition of a gaseous mixture that it is called biogas Themistoklis Tefsas has been working in the field of anaerobic digestion and biogas production for the past seven years we are in the field of biogas sector and we've called him to learn more about what happens under these conditions and how humans found a way to emulate what happens in nature. Curious enough, given how we started this biogas journey, the first anaerobic digestion plant was built in Mumbai, India, in 1859. It was built in a lapel colony to deal with the sewage, but little else is known about it. What we do know is that this technology soon reached England. London, 1858 the year of the Great Stink. With the Industrial Revolution rolling along strongly and people moving en masse from the countryside, it is estimated that the population of London in the summer of 1858 was around 2.5 million people. The city's infrastructure had not been designed to handle so many people, so as temperatures rose and the sewage system overflowed, bad things happened dumping directly into the River Thames, which was also the main source of drinking water for the city, the smell of raw sewage became overpowering. There was widespread illness and the situation got so out of hand, the stench was so unbearable that the Parliament was forced to suspend its sessions. But as often happens, with crisis came opportunity. Nowadays, if you walk through the streets of London, along the Strand from Trafalgar Square, a small alleyway opens. It goes down towards the riverbank. The street name sign spells Carting Lane. If you walk down and towards the end of it, you'll see a peculiar looking streetlight. It's nothing spectacular, it's cast iron, ornate. It emits a soft light that shines throughout the day. You're looking at London's last remaining fart lamp. Yes, you heard it right. A fart lamp. Remember when we mentioned methane, the, the flammable gas? had a bad habit of catching fire. After the Great Stink episode, when the first modern sewer system was being laid beneath the streets, the plumbing brought with it a major problem. Wastewater fermented, giving rise to the buildup of methane that could potentially lead to the underground sewers exploding. Plumbing runs under the streets, under the houses. You don't want it blowing up. 
One solution for this problem was to drill holes directly into the sewers, so stagnant gases could float up and disperse in the air. But it brought with it the same problem as dumping it directly into the river, a rotten stench. To tackle this problem, a man called Joseph Webb came up with a device dubbed Sewer Gas Destructor. It was, in fact, a lamp. Difficult to tell apart from the ordinary gas lamps that were found all over London, the purpose of this device was not to illuminate the streets at night, but rather to remove the sewer gases and their accompanying hazards. The only one of these perpetual flame lamps left is the one on Carting Lane. At its feet, a plaque reads. The adjacent street light is the last remaining sewer gas destructor lamp in the city of Westminster. Installed in association with Sir Joseph Bazalgette's revolutionary Victoria Embankment sewer, which opened in 1870, this cast-iron ornamental lamp standard with original lantern continues to burn off residual biogas. The London wastewater crisis led us to invent perpetual lamps to dispose of a potentially dangerous substance. And now we face another crisis, a war, where biogas is also in the spotlight. Well, the conflict in Ukraine and the sanctions on Russia have led to another surge in the cost of oil and gas. Energy experts in the UK are warning that the cost of the average household dual fuel bill could rise by at least £700 by the time the new energy cap comes into force in the autumn. Until now, we've relied heavily on natural gas to burn at power plants and produce electricity, or to use as a direct source of energy in our homes. But we are now immersed in an energy crisis. To solve it, Europe needs to become energetically independent. And that is where biogas comes in. First of all, biogas is not a fossil fuel uh, like uh, natural gas. Natural gas is extracted from deposits deep below the surface of uh, the earth. And uh, as with any other fossil fuel, natural gas is not a renewable source. Uh, Their composition, uh, of course, is uh, similar. Uh, Biomethane uh, is a purified biogas and uh, can be pumped through the same pipelines uh, as natural gas. It can be used to generate electricity, to power our homes, our factories, and even uh, our cars. Just the same way natural gas is used. The way these two gases are created? That's another story. As the leading biogas producing region, Europe has around 20,000 biogas plants, with the majority of these situated in Germany. Themistocles, researches biogas production in Greece, at La Cada's biogas plant, where... Biogas is produced through the decomposition of organic material in uh, big digesters, in very big tanks, and the resulting gaseous uh, product is called biogas. It has a methane content of 60% approximately and uh, 40% of carbon dioxide. The process that happens inside those big tanks is ultimately fermentation. In a way similar to what happens inside our bowels when we eat and digest food. And as such, it has a lot of room for improvement. And that is exactly what micro for biogas is working to achieve. So I think that micro for biogas, the origin of the project was a, a clear synergy between what we are doing in, in our lab in the University of Valencia, which is basically applied microbiology. So we are bacterial hunters. We look for microorganisms, bacteria, archaea, fungi um, in the natural environment that can be used in a wide range of um, industrial processes. So this is what we do. And um, I went to a radio interview um, in which I met uh, another person that was invited there, who was uh, Rafa, uh, the major of Aras de los Olmos. Aras de los Olmos is a small town, in a mountainous area some 100 kilometers northwest of Valencia. The municipality has an area of 76 square kilometers. And the last census, dating back to 2021, counted only 374 inhabitants. Sitting isolated at the edge of the electricity supply grid, Aras is used to outages every time something breaks somewhere down the line. They have had historically problems with the electric connection and they took a um, super brave decision. And I think it's uh, part of that is uh, Rafa's Mary, the major. So they decided to become independent from the energetic point of view. So in that uh, radio session, he was describing uh, their strategy to become energetically independent. 
that basically consisted of developing all the potential uh, power sources that they have in their uh, territory. So that included uh, photovoltaic energy, that included biogas plants, the power from a hydroelectric uh, facility that they had there, etc. So for me, it was like a very interesting moment. And I thought it would be great to have this city town included in the project that we were about to apply for. Four years have passed since this interview. A hundred years since London smelled rotten, and over ten centuries, more than a thousand years since an Indian alchemist experimented with cow dung. Today, biogas is studied in many places and projects, and Manuel Porcar leads the research efforts to improve biogas production. If you think about it, it's curious how microorganisms are behind everything we've talked about so far. Microbes have the potential to change our energy bill, they were invisible to the Indians and Brits of old, and yet these microbiomes still impacted their lives, and for sure, impact ours. And yet, there is a long road to go before we can rely on this technology to power our energy-intensive world. What can we do to turn biogas into a mainstream energy source? The answer to that question in our next episode, where we'll explore the challenges we need to overcome to gain control of biogas production, turning it into a cheap, sustainable and reliable renewable fuel. Stay tuned to our social networks for more. Thank you for listening. See you next time.